Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study on the book, Humility, The Journey Toward Holiness, written by Andrew Murray. Now, today we find ourselves in chapter 8, and it is entitled, Humility and Sin. Jonathan Edwards once said, Nothing sets a person so much out of the devil's reach as humility. In 1 Timothy 1.15 we read, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Humility is often identified with penitence and contrition. As a consequence, there appears to be no way of fostering humility but by keeping the soul occupied with its sin. But I think we have learned that humility is something else and something more than being consumed with our own sinfulness. We have seen in the teaching of our Lord Jesus and the epistles how often the virtue is mentioned without any reference to sin. In the very nature of things, in the whole relationship of the creature to the Creator, in the life of Jesus as He lived it and imparts it to us, humility is the very essence of holiness. It is the displacement of self by the enthronement of God. Where God is, self is nothing. But though it is this aspect of the truth I have felt especially constrained to emphasize, I hardly need to say what new depth and intensity man's sin and God's grace give to the humility of the saints. We have only to look at a man like the Apostle Paul to see how throughout his life as a ransomed and a holy man, the deep consciousness of having been a sinner lived in him inextinguishably. We all know the passages in which he refers to his life as a persecutor and blasphemer. For example, when he says, I am the least of the apostles, and I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. You can read this in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. He continues in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, when he says, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Again, 1 Timothy 1, verse 13 and verse 15. God's grace had saved Paul. God remembered his sins no more. But never could Paul forget how terribly he had sinned. The more he rejoiced in God's salvation, and the more his experience of God's grace filled him with joy unspeakable, the clearer was his consciousness that he was a saved sinner and that salvation had no meaning or sweetness except that his being a sinner made it precious and real to him personally. Never for a moment could he forget that it was a sinner God had taken up in his arms and crowned with his love. The texts we have quoted are often appealed to as Paul's confession of sinning daily. But one has only to read them carefully in their context to see that this is not the case. They have a far deeper significance. They refer to the power of God that endures throughout eternity to keep us in awe of the humility with which the ransom bow before the throne is those who have been washed from their sins in the blood of the Lamb. Never, even in glory, can they be any other than ransomed sinners. Never for a moment in this life can God's child live in the full light of his love 
without feeling that the sin out of which he has been saved is his one right to grace. Let me repeat that, friends. Never, even in glory, can they be any other than ransomed sinners. Never for a moment in this life can God's child live in the full light of his love without feeling that the sin out of which he has been saved is his one and only right to grace. The humility with which first he came as a sinner acquires a new meaning when he learns how it becomes him as a creature. And again, the humility in which he was born as a creature has its deepest, richest tones in the memory of what it is to be a monument of God's redeeming love, a trophy of grace. The true importance of what these expressions of Paul teach us comes out all the more strongly when we notice the remarkable fact that through his whole Christian journey, we never find from his pen anything like confession of sin. Nowhere is there any mention of shortcoming or defect. Nowhere is there any suggestion to his readers that he has failed in duty or sinned against the perfect law of perfect love. On the contrary, there are passages in which he vindicates himself in language that appeals to a faultless life before God and men. For instance, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, he says, This is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you in the holiness and sincerity that are from God. This is not an ideal or an aspiration. It is an admission of what his actual life had been. However, we may account for this absence of confession of sin. All will admit that it must point to a life in the power of the Holy Spirit, such as is seldom realized or expected in our day. The point I wish to emphasize is this. The very fact of the absence of such confession of sin only gives more strength to the truth that it is not in daily sinning that the secret of humility is found, but rather in the position of dependence upon the grace of God. Our only place of blessing before God is among those whose highest joy is to confess that they are sinners saved by grace. With Paul's fresh reminder of having sinned in the past and his consciousness of being kept from sin daily, he was well aware of the power of sin that could overtake him without the daily presence and power of the indwelling Christ. I know that nothing good lives in me, he says in Romans 7, 18, and this describes the flesh as it is to the end. The glorious deliverance of Romans 8, 2, which says, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. It is neither the annihilation nor the sanctification of the flesh, but a continuous victory given by the spirit. As health expels disease, as light swallows up darkness, as life conquers death, the indwelling Christ through the Spirit is the health, the light, and the life of the soul. But with this, the conviction of helplessness tempers our faith with a sense of dependence that creates the proper humility in us and results in the greatest joy. The passages above show that it was the wonderful grace that was bestowed upon Paul, of which he felt the need every moment that humbled him so deeply. The grace of God that was with him and enabled him to labor more abundantly than they all, the grace to preach to the heathen the unsearchable riches of Christ, is what kept his sense of being liable to sin so alive. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, he says in Romans 5.20. This reveals how the very essence of grace deals with and takes away sin. 
The more abundant the experience of grace, the more intense the consciousness of being a sinner. It is not sin, but God's grace that shows a man and ever reminds him what a sinner he was that will keep him truly humble. It is not sin, but grace that will make me know myself as a sinner. I'm afraid that there are many who by strong expressions of self-condemnation and self-denunciation have sought to humble themselves, but who have to confess with sorrow that a humble spirit with its accompanying kindness and compassion, meekness and forbearance is still as far off as ever. Being occupied with self, even having the deepest self-abhorrence can never free us from self. It is the revelation of God, not only by the law condemning sin, but also by his grace delivering from it, that will truly make us humble. The law may break the heart with fear. It is only grace that works that sweet humility that becomes joy to the soul as its second nature. It was the revelation of God in his holiness drawing nigh to make himself known in his grace that made Abraham, Jacob, Job, and Isaiah bow so low. It is the soul that finds God to be everything that is so filled with his presence. There is no place left for self. So alone can the promise be fulfilled, which says in Isaiah 2.11, the pride of men brought low, the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. It is the sinner basking in the full light of God's holy redeeming love in the experience of that indwelling divine compassion of Christ who cannot but be humble. Not to be occupied with your sin, but to be fully occupied with God brings deliverance from self. Chapter 9, Humility and Faith. Be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish yourself to be. This was said by Thomas A. Kempis. We are told in John chapter 5, verse 44, how can you believe if you accept praise from one another? Yet you make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God. In an address I heard recently, the speaker said that the blessings of the higher Christian life were often like the objects displayed in a shop window. One could see them clearly and yet could not reach them. If told to reach out and take those objects, a man would answer, I can't. There's a thick pane of plate glass between me and them. In the same way, Christians may see clearly the blessed promises of perfect peace and rest overflowing love and joy, abiding communion and fruitfulness, and yet feel that there is something hindering their possession. Well, what is it that hinders? The promises made to faith are free and sure. The invitation and encouragement, strong. The mighty power of God, close at hand and free. All that hinders the blessing being ours is pride or a lack of faith. In our text, Jesus reveals to us that it is indeed pride that makes faith impossible. When he says, how can you believe if you accept praise from one another? As we see how in their very nature, pride and faith are irreconcilable. They are at odds with one another. We learn that faith and humility are at their root one, and that we can never have more of true faith than we have of true humility. It is possible to have strong intellectual convictions and assurance of the truth while pride is still in the heart, but it makes living faith, which has power with God, impossible. We have only to think for a moment what faith is. Is it not a confession of helplessness, the surrender to God that waits to let him work? Is it not in itself the most humbling thing there can be, the acceptance of our place as dependents who can claim or get or do nothing 
but what grace bestows. Humility is simply the disposition that prepares the soul for living in absolute trust. Even the most secret breath of pride in self-seeking, self-will, self-confidence, or self-exaltation is only the strengthening of that self that cannot enter the kingdom or possess the things of the kingdom because it refuses to allow God to be who he is. Faith is the means by which we perceive and apprehend the heavenly world and its blessings. Faith seeks the glory that comes when God is all. As long as we take glory from one another, as long as we seek and love and jealously guard the glory of this life, the honor and reputation that comes from men, we do not seek and cannot receive the glory that comes from God alone. Pride renders faith impossible. Salvation comes through the cross and the crucified Christ. Salvation is the fellowship with the crucified Christ in the spirit of his cross. Salvation is union with and delight in, even participation in, the humility of Jesus. Is it any wonder that our faith is weak when pride still reigns and we have hardly learned to long or pray for humility as the most necessary and blessed part of salvation? Humility and faith are more nearly allied in Scripture than many realize. See it in the life of Christ. There are two cases in which he spoke of great faith. He marveled at the faith of the centurion, saying, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. The centurion had said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. And the mother to whom Jesus said, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs? She simply replied, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs. To her he replied, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. You see, it is humility that brings a soul to be nothing before God and that also removes every hindrance to faith and makes it only fear lest it dishonor him by not trusting him completely. If there is failure in the pursuit of holiness, it most surely has pride and self at its root. We have no idea to what extent pride and self secretly work within us, or how God alone by his indwelling power can cast them out. Nothing but the new and divine nature, taking the place of the old self, can make us truly humble. Absolute, unceasing humility must be the core disposition of every prayer and approach to God, as well as every relationship with our fellow men. We go to such lengths to believe, while the old self, in its pride, seeks to avail itself of God's blessing and riches. No wonder we can't believe. We need to change our course. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt us. The cross, death, and the grave into which Jesus humbled himself were his path to the glory of God. And they are our path too, friends. Let humility be our one desire and our fervent prayer. Let us gladly accept whatever humbles us before God or men. This alone is the path to the glory of God. Let me repeat that, friends. We need to change our course. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. The cross, the death of Jesus, the very grave of Jesus is the way in which he humbled himself. These were his path to the glory of God, and they are our paths too. Let humility be our one desire and our fervent prayer. Let us gladly accept whatever humbles us before God or men. This alone is the path to the glory of God. And I think it would be important to note here that the author is indicating a life of humiliation. Humiliation was the path in which Jesus traveled, and so too is the path that we must travel. 
There are those who have spoken of some who have blessed experiences or are the means of bringing blessing to others, and yet they themselves are lacking in humility. You may ask whether these do not prove that they have true or even strong faith, though they show all too clearly that they still seek the honor that comes from men. There is more than one answer to this. But the principal answer in our present connection is this. They have a measure of faith in proportion to the blessing they bring to others. But the real work of their faith is hindered through their lack of humility. The blessing is often superficial or transitory because they, by their failure to be nothing, block the way for God to be all. A deeper humility would bring a deeper and fuller blessing. The Holy Spirit working in them not only as a spirit of power, but also dwelling in them in the fullness of his grace, and especially that of humility, would through them communicate himself to others a life of power and holiness and steadfastness as yet unseen. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another? That was the question that Jesus posed. And nothing can cure you of the desire to receive glory from men or of the sensitiveness and pain and anger that come when it is not given, but seeking alone the glory that comes from God. Let the glory of the all-glorious God be everything to you. You will be freed from the glory of men and of self, and you will be content and glad to be nothing. Out of this nothingness, you will grow strong in faith, giving glory to God, and you will find that the deeper you sink in humility before him, the nearer he is to fulfill every desire of your faith. And that brings us to the end of our study today, friends. And I simply want to close by saying, as a matter of practice, from my own experience, the key to this life of humility that is yet to be mentioned specifically by our author is one of transparency. We must, we must, we must, friends, see ourselves as nothing and God as everything. And by doing so, Jesus will become the object of all our adoration and all of our praise. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video.